Hello, everyone. I'm Rose Cameron, Director of Innovation for OOE. Thank you for coming today to uh, listen to Carla Hickman from the EAB, the Educational Advisory Board, talk about the path to persistence or ways in which we can keep our students engaged and uh, through the experience of education all the way through to completion. Uh, Carla had a wonderful chat this morning with us with regards higher education and the future of it in the higher ed economy. Today, uh, today's second talk is far more, as we discussed, pragmatic than that first one. Uh, the first was very much our lofty ideals about where higher education is going, the major trends that are shifting. Here we're going to get down to some brass tacks. And um, also, if I remember correctly, Carlin, correct me if I'm incorrect, uh, there is an accompanying booklet to this mm -hmm. one, uh, which gives you very practical skills to employ uh, around persistence. So Carla is amazing. She uh, has several different degrees from several different <laughs> universities and is just a delightful human being. So would everyone please greet and welcome to Penn State. Carla Hickman. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Rose, and good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see some familiar faces from this morning's session as well as some new faces. Um, as Rose mentioned, my goal this afternoon is slightly different. For those of you who joined me this morning, we were talking about the larger landscape of higher education. What were the major trends that were impacting how universities and colleges were thinking about their future role? This afternoon, we want to narrow in. It's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I joined EAB in 2008. Uh, it was just after I had been a classroom teacher. So I started my career as a fifth grade and second grade teacher. Uh, I taught in urban classrooms in New York City and in Washington, D.C. And so in my work in higher education, I'm often taken back to those days as a fifth grade teacher when I was trying to inspire my new class of students. And I would say to them that college is within reach for every student in this room. Um, and I would teach them about different kinds of universities and colleges. What's the difference between a liberal arts college, a state public, a private? When I came to higher education, I think I, like most of you, wanted to believe that that promise could be fulfilled. But then I would look at the barriers that students encountered. It didn't often take very long for them to become disheartened by the experience that they were having often feeling like they were ill-equipped to succeed in the educational goals that they had set forward. Now, that's certainly true of our undergraduate students, many of whom are trying to navigate the world independently for the first time. But the population that really struck me were those students like my mom, an adult learner, who was attempting to go back and earn a credential, not really even for work, but simply for a sense of purpose and self-fulfillment and finding it challenging to do so because the systems and processes of the institution did not match the needs that she had as a learner who looked different from others. So it takes us to the work that we see here today. If you're not as familiar with EAB, every piece of research we do is on behalf of university and college leaders. We ask our members, as we refer to them, to direct our research initiative. So a few years ago, the members that are focused on professional continuing and online education said, we need to understand what student success means, what it looks like for students that we serve. That's charting a path to persistence. This is a, uh, an excerpt from that research study. It's about nine months worth of work that goes into any research study. We're going to spend less than 60 minutes because I want to open it up to questions and hear those issues that are most important to those of you who are gathered here today. To continue the discussion, as Rose mentioned, there's not only a publication, but also an implementation toolkit. Uh, on your behalf, we want to identify practices and provide you with resources so that you can get 80% of the way there. I think one of the things in higher education that we're all trying to avoid is reinventing the wheel. So hopefully, we'll give you some practical advice to accompany the practices I share. 
I want to start with why success is so challenging when you think about what I'll call the post-traditional or non-traditional student population. When I work with what we call COE members, it's an acronym intentionally because, as I mentioned this morning, there is no one word or phrase to capture the diverse credentials and programs and student populations that these units and divisions on campuses often serve. But they typically look like the students that you see here. In any of our COE members, they may have adults who are returning to complete their bachelor's degree, the adult degree completion students. They may have working professionals in a master's degree. They have students who are exclusively online, students who are hybrid, students who are exclusively face-to-face, -face, and they even have students who are just taking non-credit. Often in this world, those students are referred to as enrichment seekers. No matter who I spoke to, though, whether it was a student services professional, program director, or an instructor, they would say, we have success concerns with each of these student populations. They might have described that concern differently, but it was still, at the end of the day, about student success. What I also found was interesting is I would speak to program directors and marketing directors. And marketing directors would say, proving and demonstrating the outcomes that our students experience, not just financial and career outcomes, but academic learning outcomes, is the way that we're going to differentiate ourselves to the adult and working professional learner. We've not done enough here. This is an area where we need additional support. Now, some of you in the room might be thinking, well, that's always been the case. So why did it feel so urgent and important to your member institutions a few years ago? For us, it was these three forces. They were co-presenting, and they were creating a new sense of urgency around success and strategic interventions for adult learners. I want to touch on each one of them in turn. The first, I think, is the biggest misunderstanding in higher education today. When you speak to a journalist or a state legislator or a policymaker, and you say, Talk to me about students who go to college. The first thing they think of is the first time full-time freshmen on the leafy quad. That's not really higher education in the United States, certainly part of it. But 73% of all students who enrolled in the United States post-secondary education system are classified by the federal government as non-traditional. There's seven characteristics, no pop quiz. Some of you may know those seven characteristics by heart. There's seven characteristics of a non-traditional student. We'll talk about them in a moment. The pain point for many of you in this room, for many higher education leaders who serve these students, is one, these students are often forgotten when we talk about student success in this country. And two, the ways that we assess and report retention and graduation metrics to places like iPads do not capture their stories. They're just missing in the data. Any student who is a transfer student, missing in the data. Any student who took a gap year, has a GED instead of a high school diploma, simply missing in the data. And so as we've heard calls for accountability, how successful are we in graduating these populations of students, many have said, I feel hamstrung. I know that our student populations are changing. I know most of them are non-traditional. I don't have ways of telling their stories or reporting that data so that policymakers in the federal government understand not only where they might be struggling, but more importantly, where we're successful. I'd say it's probably familiar to many of you. What I think is interesting is this is a trend that we think will continue. If you look at the National Center for Education Statistics, they're always making projections. Where are we going to see enrollment growth across the next decade? They're expecting double-digit growth in adult learners over the age of 25. Now, while the absolute number of those students over the age of 25 is smaller than that 18 to 24-year-old population, this is where the growth is. So for universities who have been struggling in a very competitive enrollment environment, you're seeing universities that are thinking about, how do we serve this population? If this is the growth area, what can we and should we do differently to capture a portion of that market? I apologize to those of you at Academics in the Room. You'll notice I do use private sector terminology. I talk about students as customers sometimes. I say terms like market. Uh, some faculty do call me to task for that. It is done with the best of intentions. I caught myself just doing it, but it is about revenue as much as it is about success. 
Here's the second force that I think is interesting. I'm just going to leave this one for your review. This is how we define a non-traditional student. As I mentioned, there are seven characteristics. To be counted in that percentage, you only need to have one to two of these. If you went to your undergrads and did an incoming student survey, I would guess that many of them have at least one of these characteristics as well. Here's the second force. Has anybody seen capellaresults.org? So the second force here is that outcomes are being used as a point of differentiation in marketing and recruitment. Specifically when you think about adult, working professional, and online learners. For a long time, it was difficult for those students to know the difference between the for-profit provider and the nonprofit provider. I'm a firm believer that not all private sector colleges and universities are created equal. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are paying attention to things that are going on with ITT and the Corinthian colleges. There are also for-profit institutions like Capella, who are very active in the market and have made investments in student success in marketing and recruiting that even if you don't consider them a school that would ever be in a consideration set or peer set, your students see these messages. Students are comparing you to this. What is this? So they worked with a design thinking consulting firm, IDEO. IDEO is pretty phenomenal. They designed a website that's publicly available to tout the outcomes of their students. It's incredibly comprehensive. It includes not only learning outcomes. Now, they're a private sector institution. They can mandate learning outcomes. They can mandate a rubric. They're not you guys, and I get it. But they have that data right there on the site. They also have information on financial metrics that matter to students. What's the average credit hour price? What's the average cost for a credential? What are the starting salaries and different kinds of positions that alumni from our programs pursue? And of course, they have those career outcomes, number of students, job sale rates, employer partnerships. I think it's a really well done site. It's got fantastic testimonials, faculty members, students, alums, and employers talking about the Capella education. The reason I mention this is because members say to me, why aren't we doing something like this? We have stellar data. Now, yes, learning outcomes is always a tricky conversation, but we have good data on the success of our students. Why aren't we making it more publicly available? Why aren't we using it in the ways that we communicate with prospects? Third factor. This one's the one I say don't lose any sleep over just yet, but there is some movement from accrediting bodies to start requiring institutions to report retention and success measures for their adult learners and non-traditional populations. Uh, I haven't looked at Middle States or SACS or HLC. WASC, the Western Association of States and Colleges, was a first mover here. They were actually working with many of their universities and colleges to try to define what those reportable metrics would be. When I talked to their IR shops, whether those IR shops were in COE units or just central, they were worried that they just didn't have the data. They weren't ready. They hadn't been coding and collecting things. If you do have the data, fantastic. My thing is don't wait necessarily for the accreditor to move move first, right? Start getting in your processes. What are the ways that we're going to measure the success of students that don't just look like those iPads reporting metrics? <clears throat> the other reason that this is really troubling is because, frankly, we haven't done a great job as this sector of higher education. Uh, this is data from UPCEA, or UPSEA, which is the University Professional and Continuing Education Association. They asked simple questions. Are you collecting the data? Do you know the success rates of your students? What you'll notice there is lots of people said, yeah, we definitely know, but no, I'm not quite sure what it is, right? So, I think this is just another signal. This has not been a priority area with all of the things that we work on without that external mandate. We haven't done as much work here as perhaps we should. Now, what do we know? Because you work with students, you know their stories. I'm sure you're already thinking about students that you might have worked with or interacted with recently. We know about them as particularly for students in an online learning environment. They're often the most at risk. And absent intervention can be the least engaged. 
Uh, I think there's phenomenal data that testifies to the quality of the academic learning environment in an online course. I wish that debate could be put to bed. But what we do know in many of these courses is there can be a gap. So I'm a researcher. I wanted to investigate that gap. Why are more students in online and distance learning courses not completing? Why are they struggling more than students in the face-to-face -face sections? What we found in a couple of schools who've studied this is, one, the composition of students in those online courses, again, skewed more non-traditional. They had more risk factors than students in a similar face-to-face -face section. The other thing is that many folks had not put into place specialized academic intervention and support that respected the difference of a learning environment that is primarily online. It requires a different approach. I know all of you, it's a little bit like preaching to the choir here, but often you'd be surprised when I go to campuses, they say, well, we have a tutoring center. Can't they just call them? There is a difference here. The other thing that we know about many of these students is that they require us to be more flexible and accessible. This is the notion of the tyranny of the immediate. The student who's right in front of me is likely to be the student that I work with. The student who's emailed me because they're a distance learner may not be the student I get to. The student who works full time takes their courses on evenings and weekends. If you don't have extended hours, they can often feel like they don't have anyone there to support them. Most people think it's really complicated what students need to succeed. It's actually fairly straightforward and incredibly human. When you speak to non-traditional students about what worries them, what keeps them up at night when they think about going back to school, it's something we can all identify with. Do I have the skills necessary? Is this a program that's going to meet my needs? This is convenience and the flexibility of offerings. It's always been true in our work. It continues to be the number one criteria students look at when they choose a program. Secondly, they say, is the cost something I can afford? We know, especially at the graduate level, uh, with certificates, there's often not federal financial aid. So these are programs that students are pursuing out of pocket, needing to understand what that financial return on education will be. And finally, it is about academic <coughs> excuse me, it is about academic reputation. And I think I'd underscore here outcomes. Students are much savvier about outcomes than I think we often give them credit for. So where I want to take us for our time today, as I mentioned, this is an excerpt of a larger study. I want to spend a little bit of time on the middle section of practices here to give you real case examples from university and colleges that have been thinking about strategic interventions for their adult and online students. Um, first, I'm going to look at some things that deal with the question, can I afford it? So these are financial interventions. We'll turn our attention to academic interventions to answer that very basic question of can I make the grade? And finally, just a couple of ideas specifically about re-enrollment. One of the things I think gets lost in the discussion here is the path to persistence for many of our adult and online learners will not be anything but linear. It will intentionally take longer than that four or six year graduation rate. There will be moments where the student may need to step out of the program because life or work has intervened. How do we ensure that they come back? So we'll look at ways to re-enroll those students. That's where we're headed. Uh, we're going to leave some time for questions. The thing that I'll say, though, it's absolutely fine. If something strikes you, if I say something or you see something on a slide or I skip something, feel free to raise a hand or call my name. I'm happy to stop as we go through. I'm going to start with monitoring financial stopout risk. When I speak with academic advisors and I say, if you could just give me one reason that most of the students you serve have not been successful in the past term, what would you ascribe it to? This is one of the number one concerns I continue to hear. It's affordability, it's the ability to pay bills, and to reconcile the cost of education. There's nothing we can do necessarily here in the time we have together to talk about things like tuition pricing or payment and billing systems. So I do want to talk about how do we prepare our students and provide them with ample information in a timely fashion so they can make better financial choices. When we think about financial intervention, it really falls into these two buckets. The first thing that we want to do is we want to maximize our impact. So we want to resolve as many of the financial problems that are resolvable uh, as we can. 
And the second thing we have to think about is how do we actually expand access? I think what's interesting about many adult online students is they don't think certain scholarships or federal financial aid applies to them. So how do we give them more financial literacy and information so that they make smarter consumer decisions? I may have turned it off. There we go. So I have to say, I know what it is, but I would probably scare you too much if I just started running without advancing the slides at this point. So the first practice I want to talk about here is how do you separate a student who just doesn't understand paperwork and deadlines from a student who is actually in financial distress? So schools only have a finite amount of resources that they can allocate to any student. Many institutions are starting to implement an emergency scholarship fund, a way to support those students who really does have a change in their financial status in the middle of their academic program. But you have to be very careful and smart about how you allocate those dollars. So the situation that Xavier University was experiencing, they realized at the end of every term, students couldn't register for the next term's courses if they had any kind of birth or hold on their account. It could be as minor as a parking ticket or it could be part of the tuition bill that they'd not paid. Any dollar amount meant that that student was prevented from registering from the next term's courses. They were surprised that so many students weren't taking action. Why weren't they trying to resolve the hold? So they implemented the escalated process that you see here. The first thing they did is work with the bursar's office to just pull a list of all of those students two weeks before the next registration period opened. They sent a mass, not even that customized, just a mass email to all of those students, alerting them of the hold, giving them information on how to reconcile it, and also making sure they understood the consequences of not doing so. No surprise, the email worked for the vast majority of people. Um, text messaging. Phone calls, you can, it doesn't have to be an email. The point here is don't put a lot of resources into a customized follow-up just yet. They continue to have the bursar's office work with them to pull this. So on a weekly basis, they would get a list of students who had resolved holds, those who had not. When they got closer to the registration period, that's when they started to send out some personalized emails. They had academic advisors that were following up. They had peer and student mentors that were following up. These were more the phone calls. Do you realize that you have a bursar hold? Is there anything that we can do to help? Again, the fact that they'd simply escalated now to a phone call or to an individual who had a relationship, that was sufficient in most cases. At the end of that, what they were left with was a small number of students who were truly in financial distress. So it's often someone who had their hours cut at work, whose parents had had a change in family income status. Many times the amount of money that the student owed to the institution was less than $1,000. And in many cases, it was less than $200. Um, I'm not really joking when I say a parking ticket or a library fine was often standing in the way of a student making progress. What Xavier did was create an emergency micro scholarship fund to support those students. The average dollar amount that is dispersed to the students is $200 to $250. You may have read Georgia State has done this with great success in their undergraduate population. Usually I get asked, well, where did they get those dollars from? If I had an emergency magical pot of gold, of course I would give that out to my students. The best advice I have here is using young alumni to create an endowed pool of dollars. Young alumni often can't give to capital campaigns at the amounts of other donors, but if you connect it specifically to their fellow students and peers, they're much more willing to give in dollar amount of 100 $200, $500. Over time, through that sort of campaign, you can endow a fund that you can use for these emergency scholarships. Most of the schools don't then let the student know who those donors were. It's not like a matching process, which I'm sometimes asked is a sort of kiva for micro scholarships. It hasn't gone that far, but I think that's a clever way of creating some resources where they may not already exist. Anytime I see a practice like this, I want to understand the results. Is it working? Xavier, as you might imagine, is doing a lot on the success and retention front, but they believe that about eight to nine percentage points of the increase in retention they've seen can be attributed to this practice alone. They've been at this for a while, and as I mentioned, this is one of the practices we share at EAB that has been most commonly replicated. So if you look at the data, we're seeing it apply to undergrads, 
We're seeing it apply to grad students, distance learners. We're seeing it being used very strategically um, to really make a difference in many of these students' lives. The other thing I often hear with financial distress and the kind of support that students need is I would love to be able to respond to every student in a timely fashion. I'm just one person. So how do I scale support so that my professionalized staff can spend time with students who have the most complex or distressing situations? And then all of those other frequently asked questions can be resolved by someone else. It's an example from BYU-Idaho that has developed a student-run online support center. It's a little bit of a confusing slide, so I'll walk you through quickly what they've done. At the Online Student Support Center, the first question I often get asked is, is this 24-7 support? It's not. Um, they do offer evening and weekend support in peak registration periods and near midterms and finals. But these are student workers, and they typically have shifts 7 to 7. It's a simple number. Any student can call in. They'll speak to a highly trained student worker. And the student has been trained. These are the questions that you can personally address. So it's triage. These are the situations that you can't address and must be escalated to a support office on campus. So if you look at this, everything in the white boxes, the student workers can resolve. The gray boxes are sensitive or FERPA controlled information. Those are escalated to the appropriate office staff on campus. What BYU-Idaho realized is that this gave them a way, one, to be more responsive to student needs. It created a campus employment opportunity for some of their best and brightest students. Because of the sensitivity of some of this information, these campus jobs are paid at a slightly higher rate than some other campus jobs. They have a pretty rigorous training curriculum for these students, so it's often also reserved for some of their highest academic performers. But at BYU-Idaho, when they look at survey responses, what they found is that people simply don't read information that we provide. Very rarely do they read emails. I'm sure you have frequently asked question pages on your website. They may have even clicked to that page. Very rarely have they read it. Some institutions then have created pretty high quality videos. Very few have watched them. Having a person that they can call that gives them the answer has really made all the difference. Uh, one of the variations that I had asked on this is sort of what if they wanted this to be full-time staff? I did a little bit of a back of the envelope and said of the student workers, it would require, and I think it's on here, so I'm going to look so I don't get it wrong, uh, it's about 14 FTE. So that was an investment they could not make via fairly robust staff. 38 student workers, though, is something that they can consistently provide. I just said people don't watch videos, but they do watch this one. So I'm going to make you aware of the final one here. I think that you all use this, if I'm not mistaken. But if not, I'll give you a, a nod here. I think one of the scariest words in higher education is FAFSA. Uh, so that free application for federal student aid is unwieldy. It's confusing. It's intimidating. And a lot of students just don't even realize that they're eligible especially if they're a non-traditional student, many folks assume that they can't get aid or that they've exhausted their aid eligibility. Uh, this is another thing that was blocking up the support service office. Academic advisors couldn't give counseling on coursework because they were spending so much time trying to answer basic questions about FAFSA, and financial aid officers were just pulling their hair out. So USCS, UCSC, there we go, UCSC decided to develop a video. It's a simple tutorial, step-by-step, -step, walks you through how to complete the FAFSA. It is completely open source. It is available to any university or college to use. Lots of folks just link to this. FAFSA is not the only one they do. They actually do all of the ones that you see there in the gray box, but FAFSA is by far the most popular. And one of the interventions that they think is particularly helpful is when we get close to the period when the FAFSA needs to be submitted, they actually take a computer lab, bring some of the support staff in. They have all of the computer labs ready and available for students to complete the form and watch the video at once. This is one produced by a fellow higher education institution, um, but there are, of course, alternative providers. 
it makes me sound dreadfully boring to say that I watch financial aid TV, uh, but I have indeed watched my fair share of financial aid TV. Financial aid TV is a private sector company. So this is a company that contracts with universities and colleges to help create YouTube-like video playlists on topics that are addressing financial literacy. Um, they can customize these playlists to specific Penn State scholarships or policies or student populations. Um, you can see just a quick sample of some of the uh, institutions who've partnered with them. What I always find interesting here is it's two years, it's four years, nonprofits, for profits. Uh, financial aid TV is even used at places like Excelsior, which is fully online. And if you watch any of the videos, it's a student with a backpack on a quad. Uh, Excelsior was concerned that their online learners would be turned off by that. Uh, so they did some surveying and the student said, I had no, I, you know, I didn't believe this was an actual Excelsior student. That didn't matter to me. I was getting information in an easy to watch format that I needed. So, you know, it didn't matter to me that that was a student with a backpack. That was fine. Here's a sample of some of the playlists. Uh, that they include. My team and I have actually watched quite a few of these. Um, there is no reason that universities, if they wanted to, couldn't create these videos, but part of what Financial Aid TV says is, why would you? There's so many other wonderful things your video production staff could be doing. We'll just create them for you. They're not phenomenal. They're not the best highest quality video that you've ever seen. This is not something I would use in marketing, um, but they do the trick. And the universities and colleges I've spoken to say students really love that this is on demand. They can access this information whenever and wherever they need. <clears throat> Have I convinced you? Folks are going to go out and watch some financial aid TV. Yet. At the end of each of these sections, I talk a lot, I share a lot of information quickly. When you see this slide come up, I'd love to open it up for discussion about some of the things that you're trying here at World Campus, reactions to the practices that I've shared. Uh, beyond today, these slides are a quick way for you to share with colleagues or to remember yourself some of the key practices and lessons that we've shared. So I'll stop there um, quickly, just with financial aid and financial distress, things that you've been seeing practices you've tried or reactions to the ones that we've shared today. Personally, I'd like to sit in a room and share all these best practices, <laughs> you know. But I think the idea of the Student Support Center mm -hmm. is pretty innovative and it possibly a very interesting solution. Mm -hmm. Students that can teach other students, mm -hmm. uh, I think you have a captive audience. And I like the idea that you can float the hours over the mm -hmm. weekend as well. And possibly just reduce the stress on the staff right. of those basic questions, exactly the goal that that program wanted to do. I appreciate that. I think when I spoke with BYU Idaho, they said, you know, it really was a win, win, win. So we have student workers now who are having a fantastic campus job experience. They're getting to do some student mentorship, which is a more meaningful campus job than some others they might have gotten. Um, it's also an opportunity, I think, for the support staff to just focus on the highest priority cases. What I often hear from academic advisors is there's always this worry in the back of my head that no matter how many emails or phone calls I responded to, the one I didn't get to was the most critical. And this is a way for them to relieve some of that stress. I agree with Betsy. I think it's a, an excellent idea and something that I want to pursue. But my question is actually related to, um, uh, was it, I forget which, which institution it was, but you were talking a little bit about the financial hold, which I think is very interesting, mm -hmm. and sending out messages to students who have the hold, um, which I think that we have done that in the past. But the question that I have, and it's more along the lines of a thought process from your academic advisor, because the one thing that we do not do here in mm -hmm. academic advising is talk about financials in any way. Right. Um, for many different reasons. One, we're, not, we're really not experienced in that area. But the other um, aspect of it is when you're building that positive relationship with a student, you really want them to trust you and have the trust that they can talk to you about things, but that you're not calling to say, hey, you have a whole take mm -hmm. care of it. Do you have any feedback from the academic advisors who we're actually calling and saying you have this hold, you need to take care of it mm -hmm. in terms of feeling uncomfortable in that mm -hmm. way? 
it's all in the scripting. So I, I appreciate that you brought this back up. I can often speak quickly when I'm doing this. Georgia State in particular said, because we focus so much on a trusting relationship, I don't want to be the person calling, rattling the purse strings. Um, it's all in the, I am very committed to making sure that you register for the classes that you need to continue making progress towards timely degree. How can I help you? resolve this situation? Like, is it a payment issue? Are you not receiving emails from the institution? So I think there's a little bit you can do there. Xavier, all of the information is still coming out of the payment and billing and bursar. So it's not coming from their academic advisor. It's only that the academic advisor might be used for some follow-up with students who've been unresponsive. So it's simply the idea that they might respond to the academic advisor because of that relationship. That individual would then still need to pass them on to someone else. I think that's the BYU-Idaho lesson as well. Legally, there are financial issues that cannot be discussed by anyone other than the financial aid office. And so making sure you're very clear with all of your stakeholders, whether they're staff or students, what they can and cannot deal with. Then move into academics. One of the things that I still hear from adult learners when I have the pleasure of speaking to the students about online learning, and I say, online learning, you tell me, has so much promise. It's convenient. It's flexible. You can return to material on your own time. I actually believe that it's more rigorous. You often are held to a much higher standard in the online environment than you might be in the face-to-face. -face. What might hold you back? And what we often hear from adult students is simply tech phobia. I'm not sure that I can figure this out. Actually, I continue to share a personal anecdote, but I think about my mom here who is really just working on texting. Um, so the idea of enrolling in an online course was really intimidating. UMUC was experiencing this with a number of their students, so they tried to figure out a way that they could ameliorate some of those concerns. And what they came up with was a test drive of the LMS. It's called 411. They need about 200 students students to enroll. These are all prospective students. Some of them are simply inquiries. They have not been admitted to anything yet. But they enroll into a test portal. So they're enrolled in a course that is effectively an opportunity to go in, click through, understand the learning environment, see what a discussion board would look like. Also enrolled in these test drive courses are students, alumni, and some instructional staff that can answer questions and be there to support and help to simulate what that learning environment would look like. It lasts for one week. What they found, again, for the cost to work, they need about 200 students per week to be enrolled. UMUC, with their scale, has had no problem uh, hitting those numbers. Students can enroll more than once. So sometimes after the week, the student said, you know, I was really just getting the hang of it. The student can come back and enroll at any point in the future. Um, they found that the majority of their students in this program, I think it's around 40 to 60 percent who complete a test drive, do go on to matriculate into one of UMUC's programs. We've gotten some really great feedback from the students as well. This is another great mentorship. This is not a paid campus job. This is simply a mentoring opportunity on a volunteer basis. But students like going in and serving in this capacity and being able to answer questions. I think to the point that was risen earlier, hearing from another student, especially another adult learner who might be balancing work and family commitments, um, that goes a long way towards building confidence in the prospects that this is something that they can manage. Uh, what they found again, and I stole my own thunder here, but about 40 to 60 percent of folks do go on to apply and enroll. Um, the other thing that they have noticed is they've actually gotten pretty fantastic feedback about what parts of their LMS were confusing and what people didn't understand. Rose and I spent a lot of time talking about user design and user experience. This was fantastic for that. Buttons that weren't located in the right place, features in the LMS that were hard to find or hard to understand. That tech team and instructional team can now go in and make that a better experience, not only for prospects, but for everyone. The other thing that they pointed to was that they have found that students who complete 411 tend to already perform better in their courses. They have fewer anxieties in the first couple of weeks of class, and they really hit the ground running. So if you think about a student who's never been in an online environment before, you think about a relatively ambitious 
eight week or 15 week course schedule, what happens if they're losing two to three weeks of momentum just trying to figure out the LMS? This has prevented that. They can start day one confident that they understand what they need to do. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and pause here. And I know for folks on, uh, on the internet uh, who are joining us remotely, I'd be happy to get to your questions as well. But curious if you've ever tried this or if this feels like a doable prospect here at Penn State, a test drive. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what we do offer, and we, we think quite successfully in my learning design person is here, is we offer a free tech camp that opens up. Great. Well, it's going to open a month prior to the semester now. But it really allows students to work through Canvas or mm -hmm. Angel, LionPath, all the essential mm -hmm. technology so that you're not trying to not only learn the course content, yeah. you're just comfortable. And mm -hmm. the student feedback is such that that's the number one thing, is I had no idea what to expect, mm -hmm. and now I feel more confident. Yeah. And so that's the bottom line question we look for, is after taking this course, do you feel more confident mm -hmm. in going forward? And uh, you know, I think four students might say, out of 300. <laughs> no, I don't know. They were already confident. But uh, the good news is I think we're on this, yes. and we do do this. I think what's um, one of the common mistakes that I say, uh, see from some institutions is waiting until orientation to offer this type of support or waiting until a student has already been admitted into a program. But actually, you can create the better scale economies if you include that prospect pool, and then you find that many of those students are then more comfortable and willing to step forward. Once the student has enrolled and they're actively moving through their curriculum and academic coursework, what we know is there are often no one that they speak to more often than the instructor and the academic advisor, and that those two individuals have very scarce time. Here's the tyranny of the immediate again. If you think about the scale of enrollments in some of our online courses, it is humanly impossible to be able to reach out to every single one of those individuals with every question and concern as promptly as anyone would like to. So some of the next practices I'll show you are ways that we've been able to scale support for students within that academic learning environment. The first comes from Champlain College up in Burlington, Vermont. So what Champlain discovered is that faculty wanted to be able to read every discussion board post to identify students who were struggling with the material. But the sheer number of posting conversations made that challenging to do. Many of these instructors were also physically remote themselves. So these were adjunct instructors and lecturers who were not on campus. And they were often teaching at multiple institutions, so their time was pretty scarce. Champlain said, what if we can find a way to more quickly identify key words and phrases in those discussion board posts that might identify a student at risk? They did a simple brainstorming exercise, sat in a room with a whiteboard and a pad of paper, and they wrote as many words and phrases as they could come up with that might indicate a student was struggling with content. You're seeing a couple of them highlighted in yellow here, so things like over and over, or simply help. They were then able to identify those students in a more scalable way and provide the instructors and academic advisors a targeted list of students to follow up with. Champlain has been very focused on student success intervention, particularly of their adjunct instructors, so wanting to ensure that adjunct instructors have the tools necessary to support those students. So at Champlain, this is one of a number of ways that adjunct instructors can actually qualify for a $250 performance bonus. If they are responding to students within a 48-hour period, it is one of 30 things they need to demonstrate to be eligible for those dollars. Um, they actually think they'll be able to phase the dollars out over time. They did that initially because they wanted to have rapid adoption and buy-in. And some of the instructors said, you know, that's not what motivates me. It's not the financial incentive. I want to do what's best for the students. I think sometimes we forget that that really is the best motivation out there. Some of you might want the $250. Uh, what I think is also interesting here is there is that academic advisor serving as a backstop. So if the instructor has not 
um, been able to follow up with the student or if they see a pattern in subsequent weeks in that course of that same student, that would trigger an academic intervention. So the advisor would now intervene to see if there's something else going on. What? Oh, sorry. As um, an online instructor since 2009 and adjunct in biology, um, one of the things that Quality Matters also suggests is having like a water cooler or a Q&A yes. that everybody can read because a lot of times the questions can be handled even by the students. Yes. And so I would always offer a um, extra credit point for the first student to correctly answer a student question mm -hmm. as an incentive for the students. And so, um, but I like this idea of adding another grown-up, so to speak, who's yeah. looking at it, um, advisor who can um, know a little bit more. The instructors often said it also helped them to identify points in the curriculum or syllabus that were more challenging than others. So they could actually see the volume of requests peaked around week three. What are we teaching in week three? Do I need to rethink my approach to that particular portion of the course? Um, I think this is a great way to do so, but you might argue this is still relatively time and labor intensive. They're also going to have to iterate on this and that notion that any instructor or advisor could follow up within 48 hours. If we thought about that in a single course, perhaps doable, none of us teach one course or only serve one course worth of students. So SUNY Empire State College has tried to take this a step further. What Empire State College said is, you know what, if we're really honest, there are only a handful of academic issues that commonly present for most of the students in our courses. There are students who are going to struggle with academic writing. There are students who are going to struggle with time management. What if instead of dealing with those students on a one-off basis across our courses, we simply paid our faculty a small stipend to develop a repeatable and reusable module? They developed these online modules in these core areas. So you see them there in the gray rectangles. They, instructors in any of Empire State College's classes, if they're seeing an issue with one of their students, they can then enroll that student in one of these modules. When a student logs into the learning management system, they'll receive an alert that says your instructor is requiring that you take this module in time management. In order to receive other grades or access to other activities, you'll have to complete that particular module. It's been really successful. Unlike other online courses, you don't actually have to revise this content as often. Time management is time management is time management. Uh, that doesn't actually change as much as your academic curriculum might. There's also a backstop here. So the advisors on the back end are monitoring these tutorial referrals. If a single student is referred to the same tutorial by multiple instructors, then that targets or that uh, triggers advisor intervention. If a student is referred by a single instructor to multiple modules, that would also trigger advisor intervention. So this has been an incredibly successful way within that online learning environment to provide more scalable intervention and support for those common academic issues that our students face. You'll notice in all of these models, it is a collaborative effort between the instructor and the academic advisor to provide that kind of support. And the, the core to each of these is trying to scale that intervention across the hundreds, if not thousands, of students that we're serving. I'm only going to touch on analytics very quickly. These slides I would almost have to update on a monthly basis at this point if we were talking about analytics, predictive analytics, adaptive uh, release, ways that we're using data, particularly big data, to help us to identify students who might be struggling or in academic risk. The thing that I mentioned this morning for those of you who joined me is that often we overcomplicate this. Uh, we often think we need the perfect regression, hundreds of variables. We need to track absolutely everything the student does in order to be able to intervene. And what many institutions are finding is there are a couple of key behaviors that every student uh, performs within that learning management system that we can track. We probably already have the data. We may just not be looking at it for this reason. That could help us to identify students who are truly at risk. I shared a bit of this this morning, so I'll go a little bit quickly. But this is Rio Salado's particular approach. 
what Rio Salado started with here is they were trying to assign a risk score to their students. So this is, if you're familiar with many moons ago, Purdue did signals. Students were red, yellow, or green. Are they making good progress? Are they at risk of not persisting? Rio Salado wanted a similar model, and their first out the gate had over 100 different variables that they were trying to track. It was overwhelming, uh, and frankly, the predictive power of the particular model wasn't all that impressive. So they scrapped it, and now they track four things. It's called their Rio Pace program, and you can see the four different variables that they're looking at to assign a risk score to students in their online courses. First thing they're trying to understand is login. Do the students log in, or do they not? Seems very basic, but if that's not happening, that's a great trigger for intervention. Second is their recent site activity. So what this means is they're monitoring clicks on the site over time. Are they going in, reading the syllabus, uploading assignments? Are they watching the videos? So they're trying to understand if students are actually clicking through the material or not. Uh, the third is their pace in the course, and this is based on graded assignments, so they are uh, keeping all of their grades in the LMS, and they're able to see how are they progressing on homework assignments, quizzes, or any other kind of graded material. And then the final variable is they are trying to determine uh, their current course load. So what they found was really stopping many students from making progress is that absent understanding, they were taking lots of courses that required lengthy papers all at once. They were taking all of their quant courses all at once. They were taking some of their key capstone courses in conjunction with some of those bottleneck courses that often prevent students from making progress. So they started to look, is there any difference, are part-time, full-time students, are there any sort of toxic combinations of courses that tend to slow students down. Um, that we could alert that student in advance so that they were equipped with academic support or tutoring or faculty office hours, whatever they needed. Make sure the student is aware that students like you in the past have found it challenging to be able to complete all of the assignments in the given time, given how rigorous these courses are. So it's four things. Again, much of this was right there. Login activity was a simple report to pull. They use those factors to assign a score that helps the advisors and instructors, again, understand which students to target for intervention and which students can move along on their merry way. Final thing I want to notice in our mention in this particular section is the fact that no matter how fantastic we are at supporting our students and providing them intervention and support, there will be moments when they have to step out or step away. What we need to try to prevent is step outs becoming stop outs and stop outs becoming drop outs. So one of the practices that I wanted to leave you with today is how do we identify students uh, who may be thinking they need to step out in advance. So at the very least, we can have a conversation with them to make sure that they're aware of all of their options and making a rational choice. This is a practice from Regis University. It's pretty similar, actually, to the bursar holds at Xavier, but here we're looking at registration. So they pull a registration census to see how many students are currently enrolled this term but not yet registered for coursework next term. They continue to monitor that, and similar to Xavier again, they're simply contacting those students to ask, do you intend to enroll? And if so, here are the courses that we'd recommend. Maybe it's not a lockstep sequence, but here are courses that are being offered next term that would make sense given your academic goals. They're trying to identify in this process students who are, again, simply not aware of deadlines or simply haven't um, gotten their acts together from those students who might be intentionally choosing to step out. Those students who are difficult to contact or who actually write back and say, you know, I'm thinking about stepping away for a term or longer, do receive a personalized conversation with their academic advisor. Some of the stories that the folks at Regis shared are really interesting. There was one father who had promised to take his kids on a spring break trip to Disney World and had just been given a big project by his boss. And he said the combination of those two, there's, there's no way. Uh, and he had every intention of coming back. So what they were able to do, and I think this is the genius of the Regis practice and what I'd really recommend you implement, is they secured his permission in advance to follow up. So they said to him, understood, 
when can I reach back out to you? When would be a good time for you to come back to school? Securing permission from the student in advance, they log the information in the CRM so that it is a record that anyone on campus can see. It triggers a response, an email, to that student before that next registration period. Uh, that particular father only wanted to step out for a term, so before the summer term, he received an in, uh, email from his advisor and came right back in. The key again, get their permission to follow up, have them estimate how long they need to step away, make sure you understand the reason so that if it's solvable, you've addressed it. And finally, log it into the CRM so you can track those types of trends over time. So before I follow up, and I know that we're getting a little close on time, we may be at time at this very moment. Let me give me a time check just so I know. I was about to say, I think we are. There are two clocks I can see. Uh, the last practice that I wanted to share with you, and then I understand if folks need to head out. And I apologize that I'm advancing ahead, but I want to make sure to share this final one with you. It's actually from Bellevue University. And the reason I want to end here is it's the perfect complement to Regis. So at Regis University, we're identifying students who've not registered for the next semester, having a conversation to understand if they plan to step out, getting their permission to reapproach them. Bellevue University is the idea of when do I make sure that that student who may need to step away has given me enough information that I can actually contact them. So Bellevue has a very similar process at Regis, but here in their CRM, they're actually tracking and identifying things like, what would your preferred mode of contact be? Is this an email follow-up? Is this a phone call? Have you changed anything about your living or work situation in the past? Are you still interested in the same program? And again, all of that being cataloged in the CRM. It's important for the individual student, but what schools like Bellevue and Regis are doing are then tracking trend over time. Are there students in certain programs? Are there certain times of year? Or are there certain reasons that students are providing that we could address systematically as an institution to help ensure that they move forward on their path to persistence. As you can tell, I could talk all day. I'm respectful of your time, though, and it is the end of our time together. This is a very small portion of a larger study. Uh, I will not run away, so I will be here this afternoon. If any of you would like to continue the conversation, I'm happy to. And for all of those that have participated, I'll make sure that the full publication and resources are available to this group. So with that, uh, thank you so much for your attention today.